Okay, so we're going to start now. Um, if I could remind anyone who's logged into the Zoom conference just to mute your microphones and at the Q&A at the end you can unmute them. Uh, thank you. Just we'd like to welcome Dr. Peter May. Um, Peter, do you want to take over? Thank sure. You. So, thank you very much for Joining today's session, so yes, my name is Peter May, I'm a health economist in Trinity and with TILDA and I work almost exclusively in palliative and end of life care and uh, thank you to um, Mary and Clodagh and Monica for the invitation to uh, speak here today. So to uh, briefly offer some caveats at the beginning, this um, invitation comes from the Institute's uh, Early Career Research Network and so I've frame the slides with that intended audience so I'm uh, basically assuming not advanced economic knowledge but that uh, basic you know, good familiarity with uh, palliative and end-of-life care research and good basic research literacy so I see from the list I recognize one or two names who don't necessarily fit that profile so um, they will just have to uh, uh, bear with me for the parts they already know about and of course uh, uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, talk about things following up on email so my main idea really is to try to cover a lot of uh, big picture ground and provide some food for thought for early career researchers but uh, my working motto is if I can help I will so for the things that uh, you want to follow up on or think we could work on together then um, by all means get in touch so uh, with that in mind, I had uh, five sections for today. So I was going to briefly start by talking about uh, fundamental principles of uh, economics and how economists think about the problems that we face and then uh, how that applies to end of life care, what we know about palliative end of life care currently from the literature. Briefly talk about a, a study that I recently worked on that addresses some of these issues, but only some of them in the Irish context and some concluding remarks. I put a few slides in at the end that I sometimes have in these sort of sessions around statistics. So um, health economics tends to be mathematically uh, much more complicated than most other health services research because all healthcare utilization data are extremely awkward. There's a lot of sort of right hand skew and outliers and um, peakedness because um, healthcare is heavily disproportionately used by a small minority of the population. Um, so I've put some slides in at the end. I'm not going to spend very much time talking statistics today. Again, you know, I, I, I ask me on follow-up if there were things that that particularly interested you about. <clears throat> so starting with uh, health economics and uh, how we think about economics, um, or how we think about healthcare as economists, um, it's a hard uh, life being a health economist in Ireland. Very rarely are we uh, fated as uh, heroes of the nation on the front page. Of the newspapers, we do quite regularly see a news, news story such as this, that the HSC is refusing to fund a, uh, a drug um, and invariably is accompanied with a quote of somebody saying that uh, we're putting a price on people's lives and that this is sort of in, inherently immoral. As the um, Victorian thinker Thomas Carlyle was the uh, man who coined the phrase economics is the dismal science, so it doesn't get much more dismal than uh, the economics of end of life. But uh, naturally, we in, uh, take a slightly different perspective on it than simply putting a price on people's uh, lives. And the key issue from an economic perspective is what economists call scarcity. So scarcity is the idea that no matter how much money you have, how, much, uh, how many resources, your demands will always exceed what you can afford. So that in healthcare, the corollary of that is we will never be able to fund all uh, healthcare interventions to meet all health related needs. Doesn't matter how big the budget is, there will always be some things we can't afford to uh, we can't afford to provide. And so the corollary of that is that rationing is inevitable, whatever your uh, healthcare system, it just depends on how you go about um, how you go about managing that rationing. And so if Thomas Carlyle came to my office, we would tell him that it's really reality that is dismal and economics is just trying to help us navigate some of these intractable problems. So how do we think about what we should um, and shouldn't fund or uh, pay for then uh, the sort of the basic framework is to think about economic evaluation along two dimensions. We're interested in what does this uh, a new intervention or treatment, how does it impact costs and that could be 
uh, the cost of the healthcare system, uh, such as hospital or GP costs, but particularly, obviously, in our field, we're also worried about informal carers, money people pay out of pocket in order to provide extra care, and so on. And then as well as cost, the other thing we're worried about is outcomes. So uh, is the intervention impacting survival or patient quality of life? And again, in palliative and end of life care, we might be more interested than most people in how it impacts caregivers as well. And if you measure the impacts of uh, new interventions, uh, impact on costs and on outcomes compared to whatever you're doing at the moment, then you've got some variation of a cost consequence analysis, sometimes called cost effectiveness, cost utility, depending on how you handle that outcomes. I'm not going to spend any time uh, delineating those. It's the same basic idea that what we're interested in is uh, how much does this thing cost and what are we getting for our money? And if you do that, then um, you measure the impact on costs on outcomes. You can uh, graph the impact on costs on the y-axis, vertical axis, the impact on outcomes on the x-axis horizontally, then um, whatever this new intervention is that you're looking at will fall into one of these four quadrants. So you can see the southeast quadrant is something that is more effective and cheaper than what you're doing currently. The very simple decision, you'd be foolish not to adopt that. Conversely, the northwest quadrant, this is more expensive and worse than uh, what you were doing before, and you shouldn't really spend very long uh, worrying about it. And all of the important and hard decisions are made in the northeast and southwest quadrants where either something costs a bit more but we are getting something more for it or we're saving money but we're going to be worse off how do you um how do we judge and trade off those kinds of decisions and all of that is done in order to uh, prospectively inform the decision making we've only got this finite pot of resources how do we spend them the other, as well as scarcity, the other key um, sort of econ 101 for, uh, term here is opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is the road not taken. What is the next best thing we could do with the money if we don't um, spend it on this? And it is um, rather than being uh, seen as sort of morally questionable to uh, be evaluating things in this way, economists would see it as a moral imperative that we do uh, make sure that the, uh, we manage opportunity cost and scarcity properly and uh, don't waste the precious resources that we have. I am conscious always in an introductory talk to me who perhaps didn't do an economics class that this can sound maybe uh, technical and the uh, imperative end of life here even potentially heartless and what I uh, like to emphasize is that although uh, there's some abstraction and technicalities to economic evaluation it's actually something everybody should be familiar with because all of us are familiar with scarcity every day we've all got a finite amount of money in the bank and we've all got 24 hours in the day 168 hours in the week you make decisions to spend what money you have on some things not others to spend your time on some things and not others and i could uh, cite an example of uh, everyday economic evaluation for my own life that i've been thinking about getting a sky sports subscription because my wife and i've got young children who don't sleep so if i'm going to be up all night then i might as well watch cricket from australia while um while i'm walking a baby around and if i look into it then i think sky subscription is about 80 euros a month which uh, I can probably just about afford. And then I started to think about it a minute and worked out that was sort of a thousand euros a year, which means that by the time this baby I'm holding has left the house, I've spent nearly 17,000 euros on um, uh, Rupert Murdoch's cricket service. And that starts to seem like a different, uh, a different way of thinking about it, looking at it. So if I can afford 78 euros a month, it may well be a reasonable and rational thing to spend the money on. Um, but when you think of that over in my uh, econ dominant economic situation is thinking all the time about uh, childcare. But whatever your personal priorities, you think about that money in the context of other ways you could spend it. The, um, uh, mm -hmm. the opportunity cost of spending that money would be foregoing, for example, having money in a college fund or, uh, you know, getting lessons in the many, many special skills that my children have. <laughs> and so when I present my economic evaluation to my wife, uh, the Sky is in the northeast quadrant. It would cost us more money than not having a uh, Sky subscription, but we'd be getting these better outcomes because I'd be uh, enjoying a much happier as a result of watching all of this cricket. And you can easily think about ways to populate the other quadrants there. So if you move from Marks and Spencer's to Aldi, you will save money 
the quality of the food and so on will be a bit worse. Is that a rational decision? It depends on how much money you have and how much you value food provenance among other factors. And then the no-brainer quadrants, quitting smoking will leave you better off and save money. You'd be foolish not to do it. Um, on the other hand, taking African elephants as a house pet will uh, like <laughs> adversely affect your health related quality of life while at the same time increasing household expenditure, particularly around surplus peanuts. So you shouldn't really give that strategy much consideration. So we come back to the uh, Irish Times headline. The, um, the key point is, is that they have uh, not made a decision to fund the uh, drug uh, out of some kind of uh, unthinking calculus, but because money spent on a drug that may be extremely expensive with limited efficacy compared is money that we can't spend on things that we know might work better, so hip replacements or child vaccinations or whatever it may be. And there's a lot going on behind that. I'm not making any comment on this specific drug uh, uh, about which I know nothing. And there are a lot of uh, complexities behind the kind of concepts I'm talking about here. For example, rare diseases are very poorly served by this kind of way of thinking because a drug for a rare disease may cost a lot of money to make and then you don't get the economies of scale selling it because there's a very small um, customer base for it. So there is a risk of bias against, for example, yes, people with rare diseases, people with disabilities, other vulnerable groups. So I'm not um, looking to talk any of that away, but rather to just frame the argument appropriately as economists think about it. That decision is made on the basis of scarcity and opportunity cost. The money is being spent on something they think is better value. And so um, that, is the, that is the sort of the basic five minute introduction to how economists think and why uh, why we want a seat at the table in making some of these decisions. The resources will always be scarce and there will always be other ways to use them. There will always be interventions we can't provide in any healthcare system. In the NHS, it's done on a highly bureaucratic, technical, what does this drug offer us type approach in the US. There's uh, rationing is mainly done on whether you can afford to pay for the healthcare or not, but fundamentally it's the, uh, uh, it comes down to the same thing. Whatever way you look at it, everybody can't get everything they want. We want to find the best way to get um, the, the best impact to the most people for the money that we have. And when you think about palliative and end of life care, and we have done a paper on this in the past uh, in Ireland, that palliative care is a relatively new field that um, uh, faces competition for resources within the uh, Department of Health from other better established uh, services who may be better at uh, engaging with government, they may have uh, may be good at uh, rallying public support, there may be all sorts of factors in there. And so uh, it is critical that palliative care has a strong economic evidence base in order to uh, justify its uh, ongoing supply and expansion to meet future need because there will always be other areas of the healthcare service that are also under pressure. And although a lot of that kind of idea of scarcity and opportunity cost uh, may seem abstract, it, really the principle should be familiar and intuitive because you're making decisions every day on how to allocate scarce resources in your own life. How does this particularly uh, relate in the field of uh, palliative and end of life care? Well, it's a long standing, well known phenomenon that the last year of a person's life is the most expensive in terms of healthcare costs. Um, and yet, at the same time, we know that those people uh, have very poor outcomes, not least the fact that they die, but additionally, they uh, uh, would have poor quality of life, high level of um, stress, and uh, other burdens on uh, family members and so on. Work, <coughs> work that we've done in Tilda on the last year of life in Ireland has shown high um, prevalence for around 50% for disability burdens, uh, pain, falls, depression, all things that are in principle modifiable and with appropriate interventions and appropriate supportive care. We can, if not eradicate, then we could certainly bring well below a 50% uh, prevalence rate. Uh, something else that we see a lot in Ireland, high rates of hospital deaths. Hospital may be the right place for certain groups of people to die, but population level, it's extremely expensive and generally um, 
undesirable outcome. So if you take those things together, thinking back to our quadrants, this is, these are um, people who have very high costs and very poor outcomes. So it seems like a questionable use of scarce resources. One of the issues in why um, we see those high costs and poor outcomes may be due to access to appropriate care, and that could include geriatrics, but also obviously I think everybody on this call will know, palliative care in Ireland is unevenly distributed. You're much more, you know, whether you get it depends much more on where you live than what you have. Uh, this slide is old because it says Ireland ranks second in the EU, but that is now first, not because uh, Ireland has done anything good, but because Britain has gone backwards. Um, and so uh, that is, a, but it is a thing worth bearing in mind actually that as uh, much as we um, can be uh, bemoaned the, the, the unmet need in Ireland, Ireland is actually uh, one of the world leaders in palliative care access and experience. So uh, it's worth al always remembering our privilege there. Um, other things that I'm interested in when we think about why those, um, why we see that high cost, poor outcome paradigm in end-of-life care is like bigger questions around the healthcare system. So all of the healthcare systems really in high income countries, as we see them today, were sort of created around the time of the Second World War when we started to have the medicines and the um, social solidarity systems to institute those kind of uh, uh, sort of proper healthcare and healthcare systems. So that was to uh, provide healthcare to what will be like my great grandparents, maybe or great great grandparents people um uh, born in the uh, in the 19th century people who would live into their 60s perhaps work until 65 and then uh, one bad health event and they would uh, they would die it's not uh, the systems are not built to provide uh, continuing supportive care to the uh, to like my parents generation born after the second world war who are going to live a long time after those adverse health events, perhaps with multiple terminal illnesses, complex uh, multimorbidity, um, and uh, ways to characterise and measure that and show evidence of what works is obviously not straightforward. But I think that's a really important dimension to things that is sometimes missed when we focus in on individual treatments or individual models of care for these uh, complex populations who are living a long time. Um, uh, one specific thing around that service configuration in the Irish context is that in among OECD countries we have the highest acute bed occupancy up around over 90% uh, bed occupancy whereas the average would be sort of in the 60-70% so and we obviously see that in the waiting list crisis and various things every year but there's also cultural factors at play, lack of primary care and uh, other things but um, Ireland is uh, not, it's not only a question of where you can get palliative care, but uh, the sort of high cost poor outcomes partly comes from the fact that people spend, uh, go to hospital far too uh, quickly, far too often. We know that um, uh, whatever problems we have today are but a, a fraction of the problems that we will have tomorrow. So the uh, first two <coughs> studies there cited on the left are from uh, St. Teen and King's College showing future growth in worldwide palliative care need up around 90 percent over the next 40 years uh, as people in low and middle income countries in particular move from sort of having infectious diseases to serious chronic diseases and living themselves into uh, much older ages a neighboring country perhaps more similar to us uh, england and wales see they estimate 25 percent rise in uh, deaths with perhaps 40 percent increase of those deaths uh, having palliative care um, need over the next 25 years but we recently did those analyses in ireland and ireland almost has like nearer low middle income country trends than um than some high income country trends because our population is younger with still to go through the explosion um in uh, palliative care need into the future. So even if um, we had perfect universal palliative care in Ireland today, we still need to increase 70, 80, 90% over the next 25 years to meet the population need we know is coming. So when we think about uh, that context and the uh, issues of uh, budget scarcity, then there's lots of interest uh, but also concern for economists observing these kind of things. We know that people with serious illness both have high costs and poor outcomes, which uh, is definitely not something we like to see. 
We know that already the current level of su supply of palliative care is not enough to meet population health need, and yet that demand is going to grow hugely. So um, the pressure on healthcare budgets in Ireland, not only in palliative care, but you think of how many hospitals we're going to need, uh, residential care settings and so on, um, uh, very important uh, uh, imposing trends uh, coming in the not too distant future. And uh, the uh, thing that I never want to hear from anyone who attends my introductory economics uh, session is, well, ultimately, let's just increase the budget. Because as I uh, repeatedly try to emphasize, that's the uh, easy answer and may sometimes be correct. But uh, really, the much more fundamental question is the way to tackle these huge trends that we're seeing is to understand how palliative care provides value relative to other healthcare interventions and public policy interventions that are looking for um, money. If we uh, think as well, there are other hard decisions around uh, not everybody is going to get specialist palliative care with those population projections we're seeing. So some people are going to get it, some people are not going to get specialist palliative care. Who are we prioritising for that and how are we organising that? And does palliative care have something to tell us about the uh, fact that healthcare systems need to shift from an emphasis on acute episodic care to um, supportive continuing community-based care? So what do we know about um, uh, how palliative care impacts these things so far. Uh, certainly we know that the descriptive statistics show these worrying trends, not only in population need, but um, the last year of life is the most expensive. All the way across life, really, or certainly in old age, healthcare costs are heavily driven by those with long-term chronic conditions and functional limitations. So another way to uh, think about this really is that those in the last year of life are just a subset of the high cost, high need patients who are driving healthcare use everywhere, but there are going to be a lot more of them over time. So it is a serious cause of concern. Um, and it, yes, probably not an exaggeration to say that in, in some countries, capping and, and reversing cost growth in, in those populations is really essential to the sustainability of the healthcare systems. And what do we know about whether palliative care does reduce costs and or improve outcomes for um, uh, for people? Um, what are we doing here? I, perhaps five uh, systematic reviews would provide a decent starting point. Some of these getting slightly old now, so uh, the sort of the the dominant game-changing ones by uh, done here in Dublin by Samantha Smith and colleagues of Trinity and the ESRI uh, looked at all palliative care interventions in all settings, and they found I think 46 papers. But that that search up to 2012, so it's nearly now a decade old. And they find this general pattern of cost saving, but because they have no because anything calling itself palliative care is palliative care, and they didn't have particularly high sort of quality bar, then there's heterogeneity of everything that finds it hard to uh, draw firmer conclusions than that. The Langton study is sort of interesting. One, it has a lot of papers in it, but they're using very specific study design in this area. How does palliative care impact costs in the last three months, six months, 12 months of life? And there's a huge number of papers in that area for reasons that I'll talk a bit more about. Um, but again, only up to 2012, they already had 78, so it would probably be 200 if you rerun the search now. Um, and uh, you can find some interesting things using that design, but I have some serious concerns about it. Uh, Barbara Gomez's one is a Cochrane review, so that's the best quality one there. That's home care only, and because they have a high quality bar, they only include six papers. And they conclude that although there's a sort of pattern of cost saving, they're not completely um, unequivocal on what that evidence says. So the fact that the review with the highest quality bar is the most equivocal on what the evidence tells us uh, should also perhaps be something a bit of a red flag, really. Uh, there's those two papers of things that I've done with colleagues in the US on the hospital consultation model. That's obviously very common here and in the UK and Europe as well, but all of the research really tends to come from the US. Uh, so we did a review in 2014, finding 10 papers and then a meta-analysis a couple of years ago, uh, which showed that there are 
cost savings in that area, but actually the magnitude of those cost savings varies a lot depending on what the patients have. So the savings are much larger for uh, patients with cancer than not cancer, for example, and larger for those with higher multimorbidity burden. <coughs> Excuse me. And then most recently, just uh, in the last few weeks, um, this uh, Matthew paper in palliative medicine uh, doing looking only at sort of full economic evaluations of the type that I introduced with that quadrant diagram in the opening section and they find only five studies of any palliative care intervention measuring costs and outcomes at the same time so um, they find that those interventions are cost effective but for me really the headline uh, conclusion there is that that is a remarkably small evidence base for something with such a huge population health need such a huge economic uh, implication for, for countries everywhere. And if we try to very briefly bring those reviews together and ask what they tell us, well, um, it seems like palliative care is associated with lower costs, um, but uh, the quality of evidence is fairly, is fairly low, so we only say associated rather than anything else. And then we really find there are just knowledge gaps about absolutely everything. And I'm going to talk about five things in particular briefly that are missing from the current evidence base. So a little bit about analytic framework and the fact that, um, yeah, we're interested in costs and outcomes, but at the moment we've only really been looking at costs. Something a little bit on our time frame and where we get the data from, something on perspective about intervention timing and what really do we mean by palliative care when we're doing these kinds of studies. And as well as those sort of issues of scope, there's a more fundamental like research design issue and how we get uh, causal results with the data that we have. So to go back to uh, where we started, economic evaluation is interested in effects on outcomes and effects on costs. But as we've seen briefly from those reviews, in practice, really all palliative care studies or nearly all fudge that issue, They uh, uh, and my own papers included, measure the effects on costs and say, well, we've seen other papers showing that outcomes are, are, are at least as good in palliative care. So therefore we're in the Southeast quadrant we're getting lower costs and we know the outcomes are at least as good. So palliative care is a dominant strategy. And that's uh, sort of understandable fudge and it is somewhat based on the evidence, but I think it is, it leaves us in a very restricted place in what we can say about palliative care. So the one obvious issue with it is that what happens if a palliative care intervention is in the Northeast quadrant, if it improves outcomes, but it costs a little bit more, and the good example of that is the landmark Temel study, the, uh, their, their intervention of uh, outpatient palliative care for people with lung cancer finds increased survival, uh, increased quality of life. Um, I think perhaps some caregiver benefits as well, I can't remember. Um, and actually reduced utilization from diagnosis and in the end of life phase. But they have higher costs overall because they have this famous survival effect. And if you live a lot longer, then you accrue a lot more costs. So that shouldn't be a problem. Palliative care is, in that instance, is a hugely cost-effective intervention. You're getting these great positive outcomes for only a little bit more money, but it is a little bit more money. And if we don't measure the outcomes, then we're never in a position to make that case. We're only ever looking for savings rather than value. Another slightly more sort of um, uh, uh, technical interest of mine would be that as we found this treatment affects heterogeneity, so the cost saving effect varies depending on what people have. Well, what if the impact on outcome varies by what people have as well? You could see wildly differing ratios between costs and outcomes if um, uh, those two things are moving in different ways at different times. And uh, so for, both of those and other reasons we really must learn more about um, outcomes and costs simultaneously to be able to capture value rather than simply cost savings uh, because at the moment we're we're ready for a world where palliative care is dominant but that is uh, perhaps oversimplistic and uh, uh, we're really unprepared for uh, uh, scenarios where we're in the northeast quadrant there, and that's something that really needs to be addressed if we're to maximize the value of these interventions. 
In terms of time frame, what I really worried about is that uh, if you look at those reviews in detail, really all of the, nearly all analyses come from inpatient hospital stays. And again, I take my share of the blame for that. And end of life, the ceiling countback studies looking at the last three, six, 12 months of life. And there's no um, mystery to why that is, is because we collect data in those phases of care. Hospitals collect huge amounts of data routinely on people and generally where people die, at what age, what they die of at the very least um, uh, in uh, death certificates and so on would be uh, measured, but people will usually be receiving some kind of healthcare at that time and that will often be um, covered by uh, sort of, uh, you know, like government provided healthcare, for example. And so um, a lot of that kind of data is covered. But we're in a world whereby people are living a long time with these diseases. World Health Organization, American Society of Clinical Oncology, recommends palliative care across the disease course. Well, inpatient stays and the end of life phase are not representative of living and dying with a serious illness. So there's huge gaps in our understanding. Uh, the other thing that I referenced a little bit earlier is that end of life to see and count back design is uh, really quite flawed in ways that is not, I think, well understood among palliative care researchers generally. There's a very good summary of the fundamental problems in that Peter Back article from um, JAMA 2004, and also a good uh, response by uh, Craig Earl and others in JCO in 2006. So I'm definitely not saying that that design has no value in particular. It's the one way to get truly population representative uh, data is if you're collecting data on everybody who's died. But because we don't know in advance who's going to die, it has limited ability to inform our decision making. We, we're, uh, the economic literature at the moment is very focused on analyzing the ex post dead which doesn't help us prospectively improve our decision making uh, for those who are alive. In terms of perspective, this is quite straightforward. Again, whose costs are we talking about? When we have this emphasis on hospital studies, then we get hospital costs. If we focus on routine government data like Medicare in the US, then we get um, the cost to uh, the federal health insurance programs of the United States but we're not getting those things that are not routinely captured and the obvious things there are uh, carer costs and um, costs that people are paying themselves in order to uh, cover their care. So if we see studies and we're going to see one in a minute that talks about getting people out of hospital quicker that will save the hospital money but if then that is pushing the burden onto families to uh, care for people to perhaps take time off work to spend their own um, money on medical supplies, then those cost savings are going to be exaggerated. We're only getting a partial viewpoint of what's really going on. In terms of timing, I already mentioned that uh, a lot of sort of big, big guidelines now would recommend palliative care from diagnosis across the disease trajectory. And there's a fair amount of evidence that would show that the earlier intervention has systematically bigger effects on both outcomes and costs. It's not hard to imagine why that is. If you um, are able to intervene early with uh, somebody, then you're able to change everything that happens from that point on. If you only have a first consultation with somebody when they are uh, on their last day of a hospital stay and they've been in hospital for a month, then you're not going to be able to uh, either improve their outcomes or change their costs um, in the context of that overall stay. But once we start to look across the whole disease trajectory, and particularly in non-cancer, then what is the intervention there? It's not going to be uh, specialist palliative care from point of diagnosis for everybody with a non-cancer diagnosis. And um, people are going to live perhaps 10 years with some, with dementia most obviously of serious chronic diseases. So, then the question of, well, what is the intervention really then? And what is it? What is the appropriate uh, skill mix and combination of things across the trajectory of disease is something that is really under examined. The, um, the, those time, timing studies of which one or two I've been a part of highlight some important ideas in principle, but it's really actually that is opening up a, uh, a Pandora's box of methodological questions uh, that uh, really we haven't really scratched the surface of. 
And finally, I wanted to briefly mention causality. So that uh, really, if our aim is to inform decision making to say, yes, you should be providing this intervention here, and that probably means taking money away from uh, that intervention or that we're no longer going to provide that bit of care or this preschool education or we're no longer going to build a, a road between Cork and Limerick because if this is the best value for our scarce resources, then the quality of evidence has to be high. And from my first involvement in economic palliative care 10 years ago, I was involved in a project which involved quite a lot of engagement with the Department of Health. And it was obvious in sort of off the record conversations that while some special interest groups might uh, talk as if the, the palliative care is, is always this dominant strategy, that in fact the Department of Health weren't really buying that, and I think quite, quite rightly so. So that was, a sort of a, that was a message that perhaps 15 years ago played well to, um, plays well on sort of uh, RTE Radio 1 on a Saturday morning um, that uh, specific types of specialist palliative care are uh, uh, complete no-brainer. And in fact, there was Dean McFerriter wrote a piece in the Irish Times only last week uh, making a similar, similar point where really there is a, a, a scarcity of evidence to back up those kind of claims. The sort of the classic way to get causal evidence is to do randomised control trials, but there's very few of those in palliative care. Um, there's, there's, I haven't actually put any literature on there about that debate. There's certainly plenty of um, argument about whether we should be doing more or fewer randomised control trials, and I can give people some references if they want that. In addition to whether or not that's a particularly good way of measuring palliative care outcomes, in Europe there's very few of them. I am working on one at the moment, but they're not, they're not terribly common. And in America, where overwhelmingly the trials happen, they're never fully uh, sized for economic analysis. So if you're doing an economic evaluation, you need more people than if you're just doing a standard clinical evaluation because of the, the awkward utilization data. You need more people to be confident of showing a, a significant effect. And um, for political reasons, American RCTs are basically never funded to have adequate power for economic analyses. So, um, even if you think RCTs are great, I would be scared or great in the field of palliative care, I still wouldn't be over relying on them to answer the sort of problems that we have. And instead, we need to be much more proactive in thinking about what we call quasi-experimental designs. So using large observational data sets that capture the breadth and the heterogeneity of what is going on in palliative care populations, but using them in clever ways that allow us to actually isolate um, affect and deliver high levels of evidence. So one important concept there will be instrumental variables. Uh, Joan Penrod and Partha Dev did a paper about that in palliative care a good while ago now, but it's just a paper in, um, paper in principle, I think, and then they did use it in practice. Um, the Gertler reference is quite good. It's not an economics paper at all because this is the thing that loads of fields in health science worry with. They can't, or social science full stop, can't solve every problem with a trial. So the Gertler thing is basically an online book published by the World Bank talking about lots of different ways to evaluate programs. And there's a chapter on uh, difference in differences and interrupted time series, which are different types of before and after study. We Again, we can, we can look at an example of this in a minute. But if you're looking at, um, let's say, two hospitals before, uh, in the before phase, and then one of those hospitals introduces a palliative medicine service, then you can look at the outcomes of palliative uh, care patients after that and compare is the, uh, uh, have the outcomes changed at the hospital with a palliative care service rather than the one that didn't introduce one. That's a sort of simplistic idea there. And if you can't do any kind of um, managing for those kind of bias, then at the very least uh, using propensity scores to manage the observed uh, confounding that we see should be a sort of bare minimum approach. So um, without doubt the economic evidence on palliative care is very weak relative to its very widely acknowledged policy importance. It's a priority in basically the policy documentation of every high income country in the world and yet there are five full economic evaluations of it which is uh, fairly staggering. Nobody can argue with the, the patterns in the descriptive data, but we're uh, well short of causal evidence. And um, uh, we see that in lots of recurring limitations, of which I have cited five, 
firstly, that sort of lack of cost consequence analysis. One thing I haven't touched on is uh, what's called the quality problem. So that's also, if you're going to do a cost consequence analysis, how are you measuring the consequences? How are you measuring the outcomes in palliative care? That itself is, is, a, is a controversial area. So that is something, uh, another aspect to potentially read up on or we can talk more about. Um, there's the question of following people over the full trajectory of disease and not just where we happen to have data on them, when they're in hospitals and when they're at end of life. There's a question of how it's impacting people, uh, uh, well, the patients themselves and their families rather than uh, just the formal healthcare system. There's questions about what we actually mean by palliative care once we take that whole trajectory approach. And there's the question of moving ourselves up the pyramid of evidence. The important final thing on that is, I'm not suggesting that any of this is easy. The status quo reflects a lot of hard work by a lot of people much cleverer than me. And it's just um, uh, the fact that this is extremely difficult, challenging area to work in. And so we should not be thinking about silver bullets that are going to solve all of these things at once, but that nonetheless addressing them really has to be our goal. And very quickly, I'm going to talk about an Irish study that does just a small fraction of this. So this is a study of uh, a, a tool to try to increase palliative medicine referral in the emergency department. Because most people in hospital are older and have a serious illness, and most of those people enter via the emergency department. And yet historically, palliative care activity in emergency departments is very low due to um, sort of poor integration between the emergency and palliative uh, specialisms. But as we've seen, earlier palliative care involvement should be systematically associated with a bigger treatment effect, changing outcomes more, lowering costs more. And so in principle, the idea of catching people earlier, of engaging with them at their point of entry, rather than waiting until they're at the hospital generally, should be a, uh, is potentially a dominant strategy. So about five years ago, Vincent's uh, hospital introduced a new tool in the emergency department to try to increase palliative med medicine referral rates. We did a sort of a first paper on this published last year, um, was sort of proof of concept thing, and then we're going to follow up with a bigger uh, meteor paper hopefully this year. What the um, uh, tool did was it had this four parts. So there's a flagging system. If you come into the uh, emergency department and you've previously been in Vincent's and had palliative care, then the system immediately recognises you and tells the palliative medicine service that you're in the ED. So you're not uh, waiting until uh, the palliative medicine service, until you move to another ward and the palliative medicine service happens to stumble across you. It's that proactive engagement. Then there's a screening checklist so that for emergency department staff who might not be uh, strong in identifying palliative care needs, among those who were unknown previously to the palliative medicine service, they're being identified. There's a uh, palliative medicine service are going to the ED every day and try and basically looking through the charts and seeing if there's anybody who's being missed. And they did various education uh, things to uh, upskill emergency department staff in their awareness and knowledge of um, palliative care principles. And then what we did initially in the first round of this study was we looked at, well, is that tool increasing, uh, improving referral rates in the ED? And is it reducing hospital length of stay? Is getting the earlier palliative medicine service involvement meaning that people are getting discharged from hospital quicker? So there's lots of ways in which this is not addressing all of the gaps I talked about earlier, but the two ways in which it has relevance to the sort of gaps I'm talking about is one, there's this question of timing, is we're, we're investigating a little bit with earlier intervention, is that systematically better? And there's a bit of a source of, well, I don't know whether we would quite call the first paper causal, I think the second paper hopefully will be, we're moving a bit more towards causal inference, whereby uh, some of the biases that, uh, that really uh, riddle a lot of observational palliative care studies are, are handled a bit better. So we're looking to evaluate, has this tool, uh, we, we look before they, they introduce the tool and afterwards, what's the part of, for people who receive palliative care, what proportion of them are getting palliative care in the ED rather than working, waiting for later, and how is uh, receiving palliative care in the ED versus later impacting hospital length of stay. And the uh, answer to the first question, does the tool increase your likelihood of receiving a palliative care, med uh, palliative care referral in the ED? 
there's a very large odds ratio. You're about the people with palliative care needs are about 10 times more likely to get their referral in the ED rather than later. Um, once the tool is implemented, very for statistically minded people, we'll notice a very wide confidence interval there, and there's a lot of uncertainty here that will hopefully come down in the second paper. But the 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 you know the 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 significance of the effect really is uh, marked for a small size. And then similarly in the second analysis, we see that having a palliative medicine uh, referral in the ED versus later has a very big estimated effect on your length of stay. So it might reduce length of stay by up to 10 days. I would expect that will come down in the second paper when we get a bit of a better sample and better methods. But again, the point stands that's exactly what we would have hypothesized. It's consistent with what things that we've done in America. So uh, obviously 10 days in hospital is a lot of a lot of money so that would be a large cost saving effect translated into euros so what we're arguing from that kind of analysis is that these are results that can inform how hospitals uh, make clinical decisions about caring for patients with serious illness the tool increases uh, referral rates at the earliest point of entry and it looks associated with reduced costs by reducing length of stay reducing tests um, and uh, uh, potentially reducing medications. We're going to look into that a little bit more. There are assumptions underlying it most importantly that the groups before and after the tool were introduced don't differ for reasons that we're not measuring. If they do, then that's a bias. But assuming that there's no reason really to think why people admitted to the Vincent's Emergency Department with serious illness are really that different in 2013 to 2015, then that's a much stronger research design than the sort of uh, cohort studies matched on observed characteristics that we often see because uh, individual level uh, confounding should be much less of a concern. Of course, we're, uh, we're not um, measuring outcomes in this study, so reduced length of stay is only a good thing as long as uh, people's quality of life and so on are, are uh, are at least as good, and that it's not placing an undue burden at home post discharge. Um, and as I say, we will be uh, rolling out a well. They're rolling out their the uh, tool in a second hospital at the moment, and we now we've had five years of the tool. We can do a much bigger, more rigorous analysis of what's going on, and we will be incorporating quality of life measures um, as as well as hospital mortality in that. <clears throat> So very briefly, uh, to finish, uh, I was given this title of opportunities and challenges. So uh, in terms of challenges, we're not short of those. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there's lots of reasons why the evidence base in palliative care is so slim relative to its policy importance. It is really difficult to do studies on this population and for an intervention that happens in lots of different settings over a long period of time. But improving that evidence base is critical if we are gonna uh, get the appropriate services to meet the needs of people given this huge growing population need. Um, we know that, uh, yeah, the current limitations reflect challenges we're all familiar with in this area, but we do want to get better at expanding the scope of our analyses at, at capturing consequences as well as costs so we can look at value, not just cost savings, and improve our use of observational data. I suppose where the opportunities comes in is that this is universally recognized as a priority everywhere. And although palliative care research is underfunded, uh, again, relative to its importance in the health system, my own experience is, is that if you can uh, find a way to emphatically move on the evidence base we have, rather than uh, being stuck in the, the sort of boxed in by these long-standing restrictions, then uh, certainly it is possible to uh, do good studies and exert policy influence um, in Ireland and internationally. So um, we've seen palliative care has changed a lot in the 20, last 20 years. The, in the last five years, I think humankind has uh, collected more data than in the entirety of its existence previous to that. So in terms of uh, looking for data, and things to evaluate, then uh, there the, the stands to reason there must be opportunities to do so. If I was picking out two priorities, then I would say that the, uh, definitely getting out of hospitals and out of that receiving cohort design to think um, about those uncaptured aspects 
what's happening in users, what's happening uh, in people's homes is really critical. And I really think that uh, as we start to collect this huge amount of observational data, we enter this era of big data, then uh, upping our game for causality with observational data is really going to be key. Of course, we know that in Ireland, Ireland is not a world leader in uh, healthcare data uh, collection. And um, so we should not be thinking about solving all of these problems at once. Instead, particularly for early career re researchers such as this audience, if you can figure out how to um, access or uh, link one set of data that would allow us to address one uh, problem then uh, in, a re in a serious and robust way, then um, that would be a significant contribution when the, uh, uh, when the field is at a very underdeveloped stage as it is at the moment opportunities are there for contribution. And when we think specifically about this business of causality with observational data, I mean, the principle here is that you want to exploit differences. If things are changing in the real world, then can we observe how things are before and after those changes occur? Um, are changes in access, changes in provision, improving outcomes, changing costs? Well, palliative care has uh, changed more than most aspects of healthcare in the last 20 years. So we should not be short of differences. As I mentioned earlier, the Gertler reference uh, would give you like not even a, an economics perspective, but general uh, insight into how we could think about program evaluations in lots of different fields. And if you particularly want to uh, uh, subsume yourself in uh, economics, then the uh, Cunningham, uh, uh, Scott Cunningham in the US is the sort of the uh, godfather of this cause and inference with uh, observational data. I think the most important thing about that is it's not something where you pick up one paper and then you work out how you're going to change care of uh, serious illness. It's that you uh, you take the time to do a lot of reading and understand how that um, how those mechanisms work, and then over time, my experience is over time you start to observe more and more potential opportunities for that kind of work. Thanks.